let's get started with a key question. What is the primary aim of the literature review? And just in a nutshell, a literature review is a comprehensive summary of previous research on a topic. The literature review surveys scholarly articles, books, and grey literature like theses and reports, etc., and other sources relevant to a particular area of research. So the review should enumerate or describe or summarize and critically and objectively evaluate and clarify the body of previous research that is out there. You can go to the next slide, Hawa. So when you write a thesis or a proposal or, or even a research paper, you will have to conduct a literature review to situate your research within this existing body of knowledge. So it provides an overview of the current knowledge, allowing you to identify relevant theories, methods and the gaps in the existing research um, out there. So you'll see where the gaps are and where your research will fit into those gaps. You, your literature review also demonstrates your knowledge of the particular field of research that you are embarking upon. So there are some key, key questions that you should answer. What is already known about the topic? What have been done by others? Why is your research still necessary if there's this huge body of research? Your research, your, your, your literature review must clearly show how your research addresses a gap or contributes to a debate. And then how does your work fit in with what has already been done? Thus, it provides a detailed context for your study or for your work or for your paper that you're embarking upon. The literature review also demonstrates that your work has significance. It is needed out there. You need to argue for why your research is necessary. It shows that your work will lead to new knowledge in this whatever field it is that you are researching. It also clearly shows a theoretical basis for the work you propose to do. So in summary, the literature review gives you a chance to demonstrate your familiarity with the topic and the scholarly context. It positions yourself in relation to other researchers and theorists, and it shows how your research addresses a gap or contribute to a particular debate. Next slide, please, Hawa. So how would one then separate a good literature review from a poor review um, of existing literature? So a good literature review will order articles and books to focus on unresolved debates, inconsistencies, tensions, and questions in a particular research field. It will explain the historical background to a topic. So you will look at what seminal work has been done. Seminal work relates to who came up with a particular idea or start, who were the, 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 the people that did groundbreaking research on a particular topic. So these are the, are the seminal works that you have to also include and acknowledge within your literature review. So you highlight your gaps in the existing research. You describe and compare the schools of thought on an issue. So, so you, some criticality must come into your literature review. And then you synthesize. In other words, you weave it together, past and current research on the topic and show how your research fits in this body. You also highlight and highlight and critique research methods. You, you also highlight and critique other studies that was done. So your voice comes through within your literature review. It's a matter of how you um, how you structure your argument. So you note areas of disagreement and show how researchers disagree on a particular topic and then justify the topic you plan to investigate. You also want to convince the reader that your research will address some important limitation or deficiency deficiency in research. So besides providing a backdrop to your own study, the literature review also provides a baseline against which you compare your own findings in your study or in your in your paper that you or, or. so your discussion section will then incorporate what the literature also um, says. Next slide, please. Hello. So how do we begin with the literature review? So before you start searching for literature, ensure that you have already a clearly defined topic. 
start by indicating the boundaries of your literature review. So there's huge, huge amounts of literature out there, but you have to be concise in, in, in terms of what you are wanting to research. So for example, if you focus on violence, there is such a huge, huge massive body of research that has been done on violence, but your particular topic will guide you. Maybe you will look at um, uh, childhood violence or, or child maltreatment or intimate partner violence, and that's how you focus your literature searches. So what are you looking at specifically? Outline what you will be covering in your literature review and note that a good title will guide your literature review. If your title is concise and it clearly states what it is that you're going to, 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 to research, any reader or any reviewer must be able to see from your title what your whole thesis is about or what your whole paper is about. So your title is your guiding kind of light for your literature review as well. And writing a literature review involves finding relevant publications such as books and journal articles, and like I indicated, grey literature. There's also some important um, newspaper articles. It depends on your study. So, for example, if you want to draw from um, a, a well-known um, um, paper, um, online um, paper such as uh, Conversation, because it is renowned already um, in academia that people write in this um, or, um, or in the Mail and Guardian, for example, in these kind of, 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 of um, media of formats. So even if, if there's um, videos out there, say if your study is about a particular um, usage of, of certain media, etc., then obviously media will be part of your review. Um, so critically analyzing your, 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 your papers or, or, or your books or your journal articles or existing um, thesis or reports from companies, etc., and explaining what you found. So there are five key steps. You search for relevant literature, you evaluate the sources, you identify the themes, debates and gaps, you outline the structure for your review, and you write your literature review. But you must bear in mind a good literature review doesn't just summarize sources, it analyzes, synthesizes, critically evaluate to provide a clear picture of the state of knowledge on a particular subject. And a good way to, 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 um, to, to structure your literature review or to guide your literature review is to use a funnel approach. Next slide, please, Hawa. So the final method of structuring a literature review is designed to make sure that all the objectives of the literature review are met automatically. If you apply properly your citations and originality, as well as the theory based context and significance of your work will all emerge in this process. So you start your review from the general to the specific. So say, for example, I want to find out um, uh, about um, the perpetration of intimate, uh, intimate partner violence by women, right? So, so my literature review has to look broadly first at violence. I, I have to define what violence is, so I will have to get the definition of what is violence, how is violence defined, and then I must come, come down from the broad um, notion of violence, come to the specific of of the different forms of violence and then focus on intimate partner violence. And then when you focus on intimate partner violence, say for example, in your literature review, you, you find that no study that studies has been done on the contributory factors that speaks to intimate violence, intimate partner violence um, perpetrated by women within a relationship, whether it's heterosexual or otherwise. So you then, if you don't find any literature like that, you will then look at what other literature speaks about intimate partner violence, but is relevant to what you want to research. And you can draw from that and make and build an bold argument for this is what likely is but, uh, reasons for um, or causal or risk factors for IPV um, perpetrated by women. So you build your argument like that from the broad you go to then the specific of what you want to do. The next slide, please, Hoa. So now we start with the literature review writing process. Obviously, you're going to collect um, resources and information from various sources. Next slide, please, Hoa. 
So how, just how do we do this? How do we start with this? So in order for you to do this, the, the best way to do is to start is make a list of the keywords for your study. What? is your literature going to cover? So like I said, look at your title, it will guide you. So for example, if my research question is, what is the impact of social media on body image among Generation Z? So obviously my title would be the impact of social media on body image among Generation Z. So I will use my title to create a list of keywords related to my research question. So I will start by creating the list of keywords and include each of the key concepts or variables that I'm interested in. So keywords, for example, um, social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, etc., etc., and then body image. Then, then synonyms for this would be self-perception, self-esteem, mental health, and Generation Z would be teenagers, adolescents, youth, etc. So you find your keywords for, 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 for your study, and these are the keywords that you use in to um, search for literature on various databases. So you use the keywords and you, your university library um, catalog will also help you. I know UNISA's library helps you, but they expect you to at least give them your keywords, etc. Then they will also help you with a literature search. But for example, you look at um, Google Scholar, JSTOR, EBSCOhost, Project Muse for Humanities and Social Sciences. If it's life sciences and biomedicine, you look at Medline and EconLit for economics and inspect for physics, engineering and computer science. So you look at the different um, search engines that are relevant to your field of study, and that is where you look for articles. And because you are students registered at UNISA, you will be able to do that via the UNISA library. And then what you then next do is you use Boolean operators to help narrow down your search. So Boolean operators are your and like that um, capital A in D to find sources that contain more than one keyword. So for example, if I say social media and body image and Generation Z, so it will give me all the articles that have those words in. So you can use or, OR to find sources that contain one of a range of synonyms. For example, Generation Z, teenage or teenagers or adolescents. So, so sometimes, um, People use only teenagers and they might not use adolescents in their paper, but the paper might be relevant to your um, your literature review. So then you'll use the synonyms and then also not. So you exclude by using NOT, you exclude results containing certain terms, for example, Apple. So if you're interested in people's phone usage and you want articles that has been written on on people's use of of Apple um, products, and if you don't put not in, you're going to get lots of fruit in your literature and people are writing about all kinds of fruits or, or things like that. So yeah, then, then the next step is to read, read, read the abstracts to find out whether an article is relevant to your question. So you look, I would suggest look at the title first. If you see the title doesn't speak at all to what you want to say, then you know you're not going to waste your time. But if the title is slightly relevant, you look at the abstract itself. When you find a useful um, abstract, uh, that speaks to your your um, study, earmark that you must get the full article. Then when you find a useful book or article, you can check the bibliography of those articles as well to get more literature that you might not have found. So a good way to do uh, if you have a paper and you see in the in the references or the bibliography, they cite a lot of other papers that speak about the same topic. You can also get those papers in afterwards. Next slide, please, Hoa. Naima, can I just come in here um, for yes, the students? Please. So what they can do while they're starting to read the abstracts and start sorting through the different articles and manuscripts, what they can do is also create uh, whether they're going to print or whether they're going to use um, electronically folders, for example, form the different sections. So for example, if they have articles that relate to their methodology, then they could file that in a specific folder or in a specific file hard copy. And then also if they have maybe certain articles that relate to a specific section of the literature review. So they can um, either color code or collect it into a different section so that when they have all these articles and they start with the literature review, then they know where where these different sections fit and where these different different articles relate. 
Absolutely, Hoa. Um, next slide, please. So like I said, keep reading, reading and more reading. Make time for this activity. And and, and like how I indicated, if you're going to do it electronically, you keep your references and your database and notes in a systematic way. So what Hoa and I always advise our students is to get a hardcover book. And if there's something very important that you read in a particular abstract that you know it's very valid for your study, make a note of it in, the, in, in your book and also write your references in this book. Because we've seen our students struggle for weeks on end to find a reference that they've, they've quoted somebody and they can't find a reference. It is very important that you keep these things systematically, as Hawaii's indicated. So you select the most useful um, articles that speaks to your study, you probably won't be able to read absolutely everything that has been written on the topic, but you have to evaluate which sources are most relevant to your question or your research questions or your aim or your objectives. So when searching for articles, ask yourself what question or problem is the author addressing? What are the key concepts and how are they defined? Because definitions are important. You have to make notes of which articles define your um, key um, concepts of your uh, your research. What are the key theories, models and methods? And if a particular article speaks to the theory that you have decided to select, then make notes of um, you have headings in your in your notebook theory article. Write it there because believe me, you're going to search for that afterwards. And then what are the results and conclusions of these studies? And how does the publication relate to other literature in the field? Does it confirm, add to, challenge, establish, disconfirm, etc.? And how does the publication contribute to your understanding of the topic? What are the key insights and arguments? What are the strengths, weaknesses of the research? So make sure the sources you use are credible because you do get articles that hasn't been published in credible journals uh, or that has been um, rejected already by so many journals and has been retracted and then you come across an article and you use it. A retracted article means an article that there was something wrong totally with the article and then it was retracted from um, a particular journal, but sometimes these articles are still available. OK, so you can find out how many times an article has been cited on Google Scholar to know how um, how good an article is and how influential the article is. And it's good to use mind maps and charts to identify intersections of research and out outline important categories. Next slide, please, Hawa. So basically, the, this slide only um, shows the questions that I have just mentioned. You evaluate and select sources, you evaluate which sources are most relevant to your questions, and you take notes and cite your sources. And, and what is important from here is um, to keep track of your sources with citations and to avoid plagiarism. So we're not going to go through the issue of plagiarism today, but plagiarism is an important factor that students must, must take note of. Never ever use other people's words without using either quotation marks and, and using the reference appropriately or paraphrasing and also using the reference appropriately. Um, next slide, please, Hawa. And describe and summarize each selected section. So you determine two or three important concepts or findings discussed in each text and take note of, it, of the most important aspects that you have identified. Okay, Hawa, next slide, please. And then you identify the themes, debates in the gaps. So how do we do that? To begin organizing your literature reviews, argument and structure, you need to understand the connections and relationships between the sources you've read. Based on your reading and, and notes, you can look for trends and patterns within theory, in method or results. And you do ask yourself, do certain approaches become more or less popular over time? Or is it outdated? Nobody use it because it's been debunked by other research. What are the most important themes? What questions or concepts are repeated across the literature? What are the key debates, conflicts and contradictions? Where do sources disagree? Because criticality is so important when you write your literature review and even when you write your results, because it shows that you are engaging the literature as, as an academic. So you then the key publications are there any influential theories or studies that change the direction of the field like i've indicated 
earlier. So, for example, in reviewing the literature on social media and body image, you note that most re research has focused on young women. So there's a gap. They haven't focused on young men's use of these um, social media. There is an increasing interest in the visual aspects of social media. However, there is still a lack of robust research on highly visual platforms like Instagram and Snapchat. So this is a gap that you could address in your own research or the gap that only studies mostly focused on women and not on men or particular age group on not on um, more on younger people's use of, of, of social media instead of older people's use of social media, because older people are also now really using social media. If you just see Facebook, how many stories are there? And the gaps are telling you what is missing from the literature. Always keep that in mind. Thank you, Hawa. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Naima. So just to note that what we're going through the various steps, you'd, you'd notice that there is a lot of repetition and reiteration about how to go about um, putting together the literature review. And I think putting together the literature review is not a once off kind of exercise. There's constant refinement, there's constant looking at um, themes and sections so that eventually once you've completed that section, it, it's well rounded and it's speaks specifically to your study. And I think lots of students, they struggle because they start reading articles and then they think they found, for example, the niche area or the structure of the literature review. But the more they read, the more maybe um, overwhelmed they become by, by all the literature out there. So I think what's also important when you're doing your literature view, literature review is take your title and, and print it out and put it somewhere, for example, on top of your computer or on your desk so that you're always constantly seeing it. So when you're busy um, searching for literature and searching for articles and you're reading, always refer back to your title because you can quickly uh, become sidetracked for example, by another interesting article that might have absolutely nothing to do with the direction in which you are going. So, so try to always be focused in that way. And there are different other methods of staying focused, but this is just one method that we always teach our, or our students. So step four is to demonstrate how concepts in the literature relate to the results of the study, right? So you need to establish how the literature is connected. So what you need to do is highlight the concepts in each article that you're going to be using in your literature review and show how they strengthen your um, hypothesis, your argument or your theory um, or your, your proposal and show the pattern, show the progression. Like Naima was saying, use that funnel approach and show your progression from being the broad, for example, violence and then bringing it down to interpartum. Interpersonal violence or interpartner violence. Then also identify unaddressed issues in previous studies. So, like Naima's mentioned, show the gaps. You need to critique. You can't just regurgitate. You can't just take what's in the article and put it into your um, literature review. You have to critique it. You have to show where the gaps are. You have to show what you agree with, what you disagree with. Maybe you have to show the datedness of the study because this is obviously all rationale and reasons and building the argument for why your study is currently needed. Then also identify what is accurate and what is out of scope, as I said, within, within each and every article. So collecting relevant resources will help you see what research has already been done, and this will also help you avoid duplication. You don't want to do a study that has already been done, right? You want to add to the body of knowledge out there. And obviously duplicating a study might just be a waste of resources and a waste of your time. There might be also a valid reason for duplicating a study, for example, if it maybe was done in America or and, and we need to have it contextually relevant for our um, context, then, then that could be a possible rationale for why you're doing a particular study. So knowing how others have approached a particular research area will give you an opportunity to identify problems, find new ways of research or angles for the study, 
over the research area. <clears throat> so look out when you're doing your literature review, when you're reading articles, look out, for example, at the methodology section. Was this methodology successful in accomplishing its aims and objectives? Or, or maybe was there a lack um, in using maybe a specific methodology? So, so look out for all these various um, gaps. So identify relationships in the literature and connect them to your own ideas. Right? So focus on the connections between the literature and the current study. So mind maps is very useful because mind maps will show the connections and mind maps also evolves. So start with your mind map, start with maybe with your basic key concepts, for example, maybe Violence, and maybe use violence and then maybe use the different um, typologies of violence and then highlight your section that you're going to be focusing on and then broaden that and so then you show the connections of um, your literature section and how it funnels down to your current study so your argument or your hypothesis is that golden thread that we always speak about um, that needs to run throughout your proposal. So whatever your study is, there should not be a disjoint from your introduction to your literature review, to your methodology, to the end of your proposal. There should always be this golden thread that links everything together, right? It's like a puzzle that fits together so that once the puzzle is complete, you see the bigger whole. So outlining your literature review. So when you outline your literature review, there are various steps or various methods you can do to follow um, the structure of your literature review. So it can either be chronological, uh, where you trace the development of the topic over time. It could be thematic, where you look at the recurring themes that occur um, in each article that you've um, been reading. So you can organize your literature review into subsections, for example, recurring central themes that addresses the different aspects of the topic. What you could also do is you could merge the two where you, for, for example, have thematic, but then within thematic, you also have chronological where there's different themes, but also according to different time periods. Then you have, um, so if you draw on sources from different disciplines or fields that use a variety of research methods, you might want to compare the results and conclusions that emerge from different approaches. And so this could be the kind of structure you'd use for your literature review. And then there's also the theoretical. So various theories. So your study might focus on a specific theory or theoretical framework that you want to develop. And so this could be the structure or the framework that you could use in discussing various theories, various models and definitions of key concepts that relate to your specific area or field of study. So now writing up your literature review. So the introduction should clearly establish the focus and purpose of the literature review. It's important that you reiterate your central problem or research question and provide a brief summary of the scholarly content. Right? Comment on the scope of your literature review, what it includes and why it includes that, and also on how you structure your review. So in your introduction, before you start the write-up of your literature review, you need to indicate right what you're going to be concentrating on it's important to always guide the readers at what we say guide the reader guide the reviewer so that they're never lost while they're reading through your proposal then we look at the body of the literature review so as we've indicated the body of the literature you might want to divide your body of literature into various subsections and you can also use subheadings for each theme. So for example, a time period 
or methodo methodological approach or a theory. So this is all up to you in terms of what your aims and your objectives are, right? So in this section, it's important that you summarize and you synthesize what you've read, not just regurgitate and paste um, the different studies down in your literature review. You need to also analyze and interpret. So this also helps your voice to come through as we uh, will discuss later. Critically evaluate also forms part of your literature review and looking at articles, you need to find the gaps. You need to see whether the methodologies uh, has worked for what the aims and objectives are. You have to see if there were any weaknesses or advantages or disadvantages to study. So write in a well struck in well structured paragraphs. You can emphasize the timelines of the topic. So, for example, many recent studies have focused on the problem of violence or highlight the gap in the literature. Right? While there has been much research, for example, on interpartum interpartner intimate partner violence, a few researchers have taken, for example, uh, taken into consideration maybe female upon male interpartner, intimate partner violence, right? So conclude your literature review with a succinct summary and the usefulness of your work in that context. So one has to also, as you introduce the beginning, your first paragraph, you inter introduce what you're going to be writing about and how you're going to be writing um, the literature review or how you're going to be structuring it, you need to also summarize that. Right? So when the reviewer or the reader reads that summary, they would also just have a succinct kind of idea or a succinct um, or concise paragraph on what already has been spoken about. And this sets also the tone and the foundation for what is to come. Taima? Okay, thank okay. you. So now um, we will look at what academic writing looks like. So obviously, um, as academics, as a masters and even honors and um, PhD students, um, you are expected to write in a particular way and not use informal language, but academic writing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what is different about academic writing? For academic writing, you write for a particular audience, it's a particular tone, particular language, the content, the perspective, as well as the aim is important. So to write effectively, you need to identify who your readers are and to take their expectations and needs into account. So obviously, uh, you're going to you you are writing for other academics who will then view your work or Think of your examiners who's going to examine your thesis or your proposal at the end of the year. So they are the ones who are going to read that work. So you have to write for your audience. So what is the tone that you use? Just as your voice may project a range of feelings, your writing can convey one or more tones or emotional states or enthusiasm or anger, resignation or criticality. Writing can show that by, by the way you write. And then Academic writing uses a formal style and typically uses a third person perspective. Unless obviously if it is your your results, etc., and your data analysis in qualitative research, you immerse yourself in the study and you use a reflexivity throughout your 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 um, thesis. <clears throat> but in your literature review, you generally use a third person perspective. So the focus of the writing is on facts and issues rather than on the writer's opinion. The language uses precise words and does not include slang words, jargon or abbreviations. And if you then do use um, jargon, you'll put it to, to, to bring a particular point across, you'll put it in inverted commas and explain the use of the word. <clears throat> so. And it is from a particular perspective, as I've indicated, and you and the, in terms of the aim, you start by clarifying your broad aim. What do you want the proposal or the um, thesis to accomplish? Usually it is meant to inform or explain or to convince or persuade the reader that this is a relevant study. The findings is relevant or if it's your proposal that the study is definitely needed. And if we don't do this, we are 
of for, um, fooling ourselves because there's, there's a need for the study. So, so, so kind of you must show the reader why your study is important. Next slide, Howard. <coughs> so keywords in academic writing are important. Oh, sorry, these are the keywords that you have to take into consideration in academic writing. Planning, critical thinking, referencing, well-supported points, your structure of your writing, of your, your literature review, or your paragraphs, evidence-based arguments. You can't just make up a thing and think that because I'm having this feeling, I have this feeling, this is so, because everyone says it is so, just because on social media it says it is so, you have to have substantial evidence. Logical development in your, in your argument, your language that you use, and your gram grammar that you use, your editing is important when you do this. So we'll go through all of these step steps now. So <clears throat> first of all, I, I, I want you to think, or it is helpful to think um, in terms of if you think of your paragraphs or your literature review, the different paragraphs in your literature review, almost in terms of scaffolding, if you see the man on the scaffolding there, all of these paragraphs come together to hold the scaffolding up. If there's something wrong, the whole scaffolding will collapse. So your paragraphs must be held together throughout. And you can use headings and subheadings to create a logical structure. You can also use um, linking words. You can also use story kind of um, uh, way of writing, storying as they call it. So structure is important, is an important feature of academic writing and a well-structured text enables the reader to follow the argument and navigate the text as well. Because uh, people, would, whoever reads it, wants to go on reading it and, and not put it down. It, it's just to give you an example, I examined a, a European thesis last year and, and the thesis was six or more than 600 pages a PhD thesis. But I tell you, I couldn't put the thing down. It was so fantastic the way that person wrote and I wanted to know what was happening next. So your examiner, you have to you, you have to make sure that you're right for your examiner, but also for other people who's going to read it. So in academic writing, a clear structure and logical flow are imperative to a cohesive text. And most academic texts follow established um, a, an established um, structure. So there should be a logic flow across your paragraphs. Next um, slide, Khawa. <clears throat> so also what you must bear in mind is that all your paragraphs that you have in your literature review must connect to your main topic or your title. It, 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 will, it must link back to that. So a paragraph is generally defined as a group of related sentences in which one single main idea is developed. It's always useful to keep the principle of one point, one paragraph, one single main idea, because it makes your writing easier. Unless you are a well-developed writer and, and then you can play around with these things. But for, for students, we always suggest stick to the one point, one paragraph principle. So paragraphs provide structure to your writing and every paragraph should only cover one idea or one aspect of an idea. A typical paragraph comprises of a topic sentence, a number of supporting sentences, and an optional concluding sentence. So your topic sentence is your beginning sentence. It, you need to state one idea clearly. And a useful tip is to always put the most important information first. And your supporting sentence, which is your middle section, kind of elaborates and explains the idea introduced in the topic sentence, provides evidence and examples, and explains the evidence or examples included. Why is it relevant? Then your concluding um, sentence is that at the end, it makes links back to the main idea of the paragraph or back to the research question, the topic of the assignment, and it links to the next paragraph. Next slide, please, Hawa. <coughs> So a helpful technique that researchers use is the peel approach, which is point evidence explanation link. And point is uh, to make a point. Evidence, support the point with evidence and examples and explain explanation, explain how the evidence support the point. So it means that provide backup for the point that you've made. So link, link this point to the next point in the following paragraph or back to the main point. So one paragraph, 
to paragraph. So sorry, one way to approach uh, paragraph structuring is to use this approach and you link your main idea in one paragraph to the next. Sorry for the repetition, but it's important that you understand this because um, we've gone through this with some students and then we still get um, writing that we, we paragraphs are disjointed, words are just put together and there's no flow in the paragraph and, and, and the paragraph doesn't make sense. Uh, um, yes, so 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 if we repeat, uh, um, really take it as, as, as just repetition reinforces from a psychological perspective. So next slide, please, Hawa. <clears throat> So you, you think of the peel approach that I have just mentioned, but before you start with that, you have to have a topic sentence. So a topic sentence is a statement that introduces the argument you will discuss in your paragraph. The main idea around which the paragraph is actually built. So it's the most general sentence in the in sentence in the paragraph. It's your first sentence. Every sentence in the paragraph should then support the topic sentence. So next um, slide, Hawa. So here's an example of a topic sentence. So here we, we the, the first sentence tells you what is a paragraph about? What is a central idea? So it tells you what to expect in the coming paragraphs also uh, within this paragraph and, and then also the next paragraph that links to this. So here you see nurses roles with inpatient care have changed significantly with the introduction of university education. And then as nurses have developed their skills and knowledge away from the workplace, worry and stress, they became more empowered and more confident in the workplace. So there you can see you have your topic sentence and then it is followed by a point. Next slide, please, Hawa. <clears throat> so what should you do after you have written your topic sentence? Like I said, you use the Peel approach. Sentences that don't support the topic sentence destroy the paragraph unity. So the paragraph will not be well focused and won't help the reader understand your point. So after you've put your topic sentence, this you put your point. This is the point you want to make in support of your topic sentence. And then you provide the evidence, provide some evidence, and then you explain and then you link. Next um, slide, Hawa. So in, here's an example of the Peel approach. So now the topic sentence is, as I have indicated, nurses roles with inpatient care have changed significantly with the introduction of university education. So what is the point we're trying to make here? So you see the point is here in two sentences. As nurses have developed their skills and knowledge away from the workplace, worry and stress, they became more empowered and more confident in the workplace. And what did this do? This allowed them to contribute more to the patient's care and offer their opinions as professionals. And then now you provide the evidence. This is evident in Mason's work, which found that university trained nurses consulted with doctors more often on trauma and pediatric wards than their hospital trained counterparts. So, so what is this about? What do you mean by this? So now you explain. Make sure you explain why your evidence supports your point. It represents a departure from the old model of hospital educated nurses who, although well trained, played relatively insignificant roles in patient care. Can you see how you build your argument? And then you build your argument further by, by providing more evidence. And then you conclude, consequently, nursing education has led to nursing profession advancement with nurses now able to speak out on behalf of patients. So you see, it takes you back to your point and your topic sentence. And then now you have to link it to your next paragraph. However, nursing students often struggle with adjusting to other aspects of work, ward work because university education doesn't reflect the real nature of the work environment. Can you see there? It's a concluding, but it also gives you an idea what the next paragraph is going to talk about. Can we go to the next um, slide, Hawa? <clears throat> so the changing role of nurses has impacted nurses' image. The previous role as a doctor's helper was to be disciplined, sober, humble, obedient, and never complain. Can you see now this links to the previous paragraph and the last linking sentence? And this is how you structure all your paragraphs. So I, I think that is sufficient. Um, I can hand over to you. So I, I just want to say that, that as you're writing your literature review and, and your paragraphs, it's not, I think, if you're not <coughs> well um, experienced in writing, 
then the first attempt, you'd never be able to put something so articulate together, right? It needs refinement, it's, it needs rereading, and as new literature comes up, it may be want to add and restructure. So it's important, for example, once you have once you have a draft of your literature review, to do what we call a paragraph audit. So what you could do is look at each paragraph, put the point, for example, next to each paragraph and see whether all these points link to the final aim and objective of what you want to achieve with your literature review. And that might just help you structure and rearrange. And we'll come to um, editing in the next section. Right, so now we're going to speak about sentences and how important sentences are. In academic writing, every sentence you write must be grammatically complete. What do I mean by grammatically complete? A grammatically complete sentence consists of a complete thought and it also makes sense on its own. So now we're going to look at sentence writing tips for whether it is your proposal or whether you are writing anything else, um, we're just going to go through this, right? You, when you're busy writing, you need to clearly distinguish, right, your voice and the voices of your sources and identify each source appropriately. So in doing this, you need to create an objective and confident voice when you're writing. You need to use appropriate language for your audience and purpose. It's, it's no use you writing, for example, academic language, and this piece maybe will be read by, say, for example, you, you're aiming for, for academic um, professors, and that's your writing level, but you're going to be presenting this to maybe um, teenagers um, at, at high school. So you need to have your language appropriate to the audience for which you're writing, right? You need to be clear and concise. And it's important because you don't want to confuse the reader or the reviewer, and then they won't know exactly why, what you're writing about or, or where you're heading or how it's linked to your aims and objectives. And use language sensitively. So we're going to be going through each point um, in the next slide. So when we speak about establishing an objective, confident voice, we speak about not using the third person, right? This means not using I. So for example, um, the study literature review discusses the importance of, you don't use I, right? This re research shows that it could be said that. So the third person makes writing more objective and less personal. For academic writing, this sense of objectivity allows the writer to seem less biased and also therefore more credible, right? The third person helps the writing stay focused on facts and evidence and also while doing this, you need to let your voice be heard. So how does one do this? While presenting a clear position and defending and supporting this, right? The reader wants to see that you have a personal voice on your subject and use it successfully to build your academic argument. So as you're writing your literature review, the, the, the reader wants to see your voice coming through, but not using the I language. So to develop your position, you need evidence to support it. And this is usually supplied by the voices of scholars in the field of the articles you've been reading. You may also present concept or evidence that does not support your position and show why you do not consider these to be useful or appropriate. And this, as we discussed earlier, is showing the gaps of your taking the literature. And in this process of interwo interwoven voices, you need to clearly distinguish both your voice and the voices of your sources and identify each source appropriately, right? So bear in mind your use of tenses. You need to be clear about whether you are discussing something that happened in the past or something that is having an impact upon the present. So for example, you'd quote 
say Madison 2022's arg argument um, illustrates that something happened, right? Or you'd say the COVID-19 pandemic had an impact upon society in a number of different ways. So you have to be careful of how you use your tenses. And like I said earlier, it doesn't happen sometimes immediately because we are not, you might maybe not um, experience in putting paragraphs together or writing up proposals and thesis. So this will take time with the refinement and editing. So this is just examples of how you don't use the I language and you, you substitute it with academic writing. So instead of saying I feel, for example, you could say from examining the findings. Or, for example, you say, I am convinced that you could say, considering the results, it is clear. So these are just examples of how what the I language can be converted into academic writing. So the second um, point is use suitable language for your audience and purpose. So academic writing does not have to be complicated, right? But it must have an element of formality. It is very important to use language, as we mentioned earlier, that fits your audience and matches purpose. An inappropriate language uses can damage your credibility, undermine your argument, or alienate your audience. So steer clear of using contradictions like don't, can't, it should have. Do not use informal words. So for example, informal would be Talib's bit of research is okay. And rewritten, it would say Talib's research is significant because, right? You can, you can hear the difference in the two sentences. Also minimize your use of words like get or got or a lot, and rather replace them with words such as obtain, or obtained or many. So be clear and concise, right? Concise sentences and paragraphs grip your reader's attention and help them focus on your main point. More concise writing will also help you organize your ideas and streamline your overall writing process. So use plain and simple language. So, for example, you could have a sentence that says the denotation was obfuscated by the auditor. Too much difficult or too much, you know, words that, that well, I might just confuse the reader. So what you could have said was just that the meaning was hidden by the speaker. It's simple words and easy to understand. So aim for the right word for the right occasion. So you need to keep your words simple, right? Try, try using short, simple sentences. Do not clutter them with unnecessary words or details. Ask yourself what specific point or piece of information you are trying to communicate in each sentence and then remove anything that is not directly contributing to the goal. So, for example, on the slide it says the crusade against gender-based violence versus campaign against gender-based violence. So you need to look at what your aim and objective is and which sentence would be more or most appropriate. Make every word count. Avoid, for example, the theorist called Sigmund Freud wrote a significant piece of work called On Narcissism, which offers valuable insights into. So that's quite a lot of words. We could have simply just said that Freud offers valuable insights into. Can you see the difference? And we always have to, as I've said earlier, and I'm going to continue repeating this, keep your reader or your reviewer in mind because a reviewer doesn't want a, would rather take a 300 page concise thesis over a 600 page long winded thesis right, to review. So always keep your reviewer and your reader in mind. 
Getting the full value of every word you write is important. The key is to recognize the power of a single well-chosen word and trust it to do its work. As a rule, the more economically you use your language, the more powerfully you will deliver your message. Also, number four is avoid vague words or phrases. Ensure that the reader knows who or what you are referring to. So try to avoid words like it, rather say what you're referring to, or them, or they. Make sure you indicate who you are referring to. Then number four is the use of language sensitively. Steer clear from expressing strong opinions too directly. Academic writing is concerned with presenting your discussion in an objective way. So there is no need to assert your opinion too strongly. So for example, one could say um, Talib 1998 has an extremely important point to make because rather say that Talib's view is significant because then always incline towards caution. You, you, your use of language must show that you're making suggestions which contribute to this wider discussion that you've brought about in your proposal. So avoid, for example, this view is correct because I'd rather say it could be said that, or it appears that, or it seems that. And then finally, do not generalize, stereotype or make assumptions about. So this, is espe this especially applies to individuals or groups on the basis of their gender or their race or nationality religion, physical and mental capacity, age, sexuality. So there are many. So you need to be careful and not generalize with regards to stereotypes or making assumptions. Now we continue on to editing. And why would we edit? So editing focuses on the mechanical issues within the text, right? Sentence length, spelling, punctuation, and grammatical errors. So why would one want to or need to edit? You don't want to have a well-researched proposal or a thesis for that matter be detracted by grammatical errors or incoherent arguments. So you don't want a reviewer to get a, a good research piece of work, but because of these grammatical errors and sometimes your sentences or your paragraphs are not linked, the reviewer gets distracted and this might just cause them to mark you down, right? So why edit? You want to present a well-written and clearly finished proposal or thesis. You want to ensure your proposal reads well. Um, it also allows you to do a paragraph audit, as I mentioned earlier, to refine your writing and to achieve a well-crafted final product. Your final thesis or your final proposal needs to be well-written, well edited, well um, also referenced. So this is less likely to annoy reviewers, as I said, and it also allows you to improve your writing over time. If you make this part of your process of writing, then you will automatically improve. So tips for writing, it says this, so you have to take a time out, right? Put your proposal aside for a day or two before you edit, because this allows you just to think about what you've written. Read out loud. Reading in your head allows your brain to autocorrect some errors. Apps and programs is also important, like spell check and Grammarly. This allows just minor edits, for example, of incorrect grammatical errors, or maybe just sometimes wrong spelling of words as you're typing. Then also ask a friend or, or a colleague to read your piece of writing because they can give you a different perspective or they have fresh eyes. Short periods. If possible, do your editing and proofreading in several short blocks of time to help concentration. And then shorter sentences. Avoid long or convoluted sentences. Rather break it up into um, shorter sentences to always guide the reader. So some tips of what you should look out when you're busy editing your, your piece, right? 
the look for voice. Who is the target audience? Is the voice appropriate to the audience and purpose, as, as we've mentioned? And is the tone too formal or informal, right? No slang. Then also look at cohesion. Cohesion is important, as we've mentioned. Do ideas in each sentence flow together? Is there clear logical flow from one idea in one sentence to the next? Do transitions between paragraphs show a connection? And or the reason you have put the paragraph in that order, so it needs to be evident. Have you signposted to the reader or the reviewer where the essay is going next? And we've mentioned this in, in this presentation. The referencing is also very important. Have you introduced paraphrased material and quoted or cited your references? Have you tried to paraphrase rather than quote word for word? Is it clear what information, ideas, and words are yours and which come from the source you've cited? Do in-text citations and the bibliography list follow the specified format? So with psychology, I know we use APA, but then you get Harvard referencing styles, so you need to be up to date about what your department requires. Then, as we've mentioned, which is very important, is criticality. Have you critiqued the resources you've referenced to and given a reason? So go through your proposal, maybe for example, with a red pen and check everywhere where you've critiqued an article or made a critique um, comment. Put an X, for example, next to that. And if you see that you don't have many Xs by the end of your literature review, this might indicate that you need to go back and provide more analysis and criticism of the research you have cited. So like I said, it doesn't happen immediately that you need to revise and edit continuously. So polishing your proposal or your thesis is a two-pronged process, revise, edit. So this doesn't happen at the end when you have a full draft, or when you have a full proposal or a thesis, this happens consistently section by section. And obviously this would require time. So don't be in a rush. Don't feel rushed to put something on paper and then just submitting it. Take your time, for example. Say, for example, Monday, you want to write a paragraph and then write it in the morning, then go back to it the next day maybe and then see if you could improve it or if you read it again, is it exactly what you wanted to say or how you wanted to do it? So it, it's a revise and edit process that happens all the time. And I think that's all from our side. Now